right, thank you. Um, would you welcome Frank Scully? Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for still remaining here. Um, basically, initially what you're going to be dealing with is the evidence that you presented. What I want to talk about is just from a summary prosecution side of it. Now, at the moment, there's this uh, lovely vehicle that you have the, uh, the preliminary brief that doesn't tell you a great deal. Um, it puts the, um, the uh, probationary constable and the trainee constable beside him back on the van or car so that they can go out and do their patrol and um, have everyone nice and relaxed because there's that visible police presence rather than actually compiling a brief um, and giving you the information you need to give advice and um, tell the, the puncher or the client what exactly they should be doing. Now, so at a summary level, you're not going to be getting copies of notes, logs, diaries, matters that are provided as a matter of course in the committal stream. Notes can be beneficial and they, they should be sought because there will be that occasion where you will be provided with that golden thread that isn't in the material that you were initially provided with. Now, in the magistrate's court, sources of information that may lead to the arrest, um, maybe showing my age, may be well sourced from the Mrs Mangles of the neighbourhood. Um, I see a smile, that's uh, positive. But more so it's going to be likely to be someone who is encouraged or has some benefit to be of assistance to the police. Now, that individual may not be the member of the local choir or the glee club they may not read to the blind on weekends. They may not take the elderly out for wheelchair rides. A registered informant usually has some self-serving purpose. And in the more significant operations, self-interest is a cogent motivator. And just because they are registered doesn't mean that they've redeemed themselves. There was um, a well-known individual who has gone to commit a burglary upon a pill press house. And he had the co-accused with him. Now, the co-accused the next day was going to be the informant who was going to be committing the or search warrant on that, those premises. So they wanted to get in before he put on his detective suit and went back to work to do that. Now, the positive of it is that I suppose that member of the police force is no longer a member of the police force, but that registered informant um, managed to come to his demise in a high profile murder, so, which is yet or still outstanding. So police... <coughs> Um, can be corrupted. In Afghanistan, they actually increased the wages of the local police some 50-fold so that they couldn't be corrupted. Now, when I was a member of the constabulary, I actually agitated that maybe we should become untouchable and if your pay was increased tenfold, no one could be corrupted. That didn't grain, uh, gain a lot of traction and um, since uh, I've actually had to leave. But... Um, there's a lot of tax-free money involved. There is the temptation there. Um, the police have changed their management role of how they manage their police in drug squads and um, that area to roll them out. But so what I bring back is the individual who's been of assistance to the police, are they holding up a mirror? Are they deflecting? But it's also the potential, are they giving um, information to the police to remove competition from the immediate area, their marketplace? So in matters dealt with in the summary stream, it's going to be common for the police to be relying on accounts of the user. Now in this regard, that individual, the purchaser, may not have been dealt with, and if they haven't, and they may not have organised a, a nolly for that individual, then there's going to be aspects where that summary prosecution may falter because that individual may have to be cautioned in how they proceed. Now, also in summary prosecutions, 
you're going to deal with potentially people on the periphery from a significant operation. Now, when a, um, a telephone is off or telephone intercept warrant has been um, executed, the target is going to be talking to his minions. Those minions may end up being processed in the, um, in the summary stream. It's going to be going through that material to establish what and if the, um, your client is going to be responsible for. If we can talk about location, where, if any, did the search take place? Was it a search of a premises under warrant? Was it a search upon a vehicle? Now, under the Drugs Act, the police can, in a public place, conduct a search in or on a vehicle, on an animal, not a lot of those going around, uh, on the person, a boat or vessel, um, and for those maritime, you know, interested types, whether it's underway or not. Um, but there has to be reasonable grounds for the basis of the search. There has to be grounds to support a reasonable belief, not just a reasonable suspicion. Um, there's a, uh, a case, the coin against Rondo, which provides a definition of what that suspicion needs to be. Now, reasonable suspicion involves less than a reasonable belief, but more than a possibility. That suspicion is not arbitrary. There needs to be some factual basis. Regard must be had to the information held at the time of the search by that police member seen in the light of the surrounding circumstances. The police aren't able to just reverse engineer their suspicion because of what they found. Now, issues may arise as to the driver and the owner of the vehicle. Were they, was it the, the driver's car? Knowledge is relevant. That's what the state has to prove. Now, if it's a house, who resides there? Where specifically were the drugs located? Now, as Justin mentioned, Section 5 provides for a deeming provision, but the issue can become clouded, as often the case, where multiple people live in the premises and where the items or exhibits are located in common areas. <coughs> if we just touch on um, the issue of analysis, does the client know exactly what they're trading in? It's a hierarchical industry and each of the players seeks to turn a profit ensuring that their risk is adequately rewarded. But not all drug dealers are in the market to actually peddle their high quality um, item to a, a, a specific demographic. It's short term rewards. Um, I am aware of a specific ecstasy tablet that wasn't moving well. Um, it wasn't getting good publicity, it was getting bad press. It was just recrushed, recolored and rebadged. Not all people involved in this industry are pleasant people and they will at times deceive those that they are selling to. Um, heroin comes in a 350 gram block. The police will sometimes locate heroin presses. What the inventive types will do is will crush down that block, cut it, repress it, and then move it on to the next party, knowing that it is half the, the strength of what it was initially. As a result, because of market practices, the item, the substance, the compound is going to be diluted as it makes its way through the uh, community. So if you do seek to have the item analysed, then at least, even if all the other evidence is conceded, you're going to establish bless you, what is the purity and what is the weight and what exactly are you dealing with. Because unless the client is the cook who is there as the budding chemist putting this together, there is going to be a doubt as to what purity exists. Um, purities can range from 
40% MDMA in a, an ecstasy tablet down to um, a tablet that actually contains no ecstasy. So there's, there is scope there. Differentiation. What makes your client different? Now, if I can refer you all uh, to the case of Brown Kerr against the Queen, which is a, an appeal matter. Um, the reason I put this up is because this is the only successful um, appeal I've been um, involved in, and um, it's just to get it out there. Um, it was a, uh, a large commercial quantity. Now, on that occasion, I was able to convince the court that the individual be sentenced for the criminality that he was involved in. Now, it was a, uh, a cannabis matter, and the authorities on this issue all related to the harvesters, where in this matter, this individual was the, the start of the enterprise. He was the cloner. He was providing the cuttings as they moved along. And if I can just uh, quickly put to you um, in the words of Justice Ashley, this case demonstrates starkly what is often said, that each case is unique and turns upon its own circumstances. It would be possible to characterise the appellant's offending simply as one of a large commercial trafficking involving more than 1,500 plants, engaged in by a repeat offender. But so to characterise it, having regard to the matters described by my brother Hargrave would be substantially inaccurate and misleading. It's a salutary reminder of the limitations of so-called case comparison. So even though you're going to have a prosecutor putting certain cases to the court, each case is going to be different. Each case is going to be unique. And if you can put to the court how the conduct of the circumstances that are before the court are different, then we can differentiate what's occurred. So it, in my opinion, it can only benefit your client to demonstrate what Justice Ashley put as the limitations of actually comparing. Now, what is sought is just that consider all the evidence that you're going to have. Consider what the um, the source of the, the information that has got your client to court is. Examine what the witnesses are and where you can um, either um, challenge their motive, or challenge their background, or, or even just challenge them generally with um, their history. And indeed, confirm the analysis of what the substance actually is. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. I'm quite uh, brief and succinct in what I've put. Um, this material will be emailed to you by the, the clerk, and um, I thank you for your attention. Okay, now it's um, still only 8.30. We've got time for questions, if anyone's got any questions of the two speakers. Well, my question goes to is your observation about the uh, potential di uh, differences in strength on testing down, yeah. down the chain. But presumably, as far as the court's concerned, the only relevant testing is the testing that's relevant to the seized material yeah. for your client's involvement? Yes. So, well, that, that's what he's going to... or they are going to be of possession in. So it's... Um, as it you know, leaves, whether it's Afghanistan or um, the Netherlands, if it's going to be, you know, a, um, a, an ecstasy shipment. It's what is, if it has been diluted, it's what is the issue there? What what do you have in your hand? Or you're alleging that the uh, the punter had in his hand, so it's... Is your, is your point that sometimes the testing relates not to the... No, 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 uh, no. My, my issue was... We don't. You, you aren't going to know exactly what you're dealing with, um, unless your client was the um, the chemist who was um, putting this together. If it's a if it's cannabis matter, it's a cannabis matter. But if it's um, powders or pills, you don't know what exactly you're dealing with. 
So it's in that regard that I would um, urge you to at least consider, unless you know exactly what it is, because I've been involved in situations where just be, a, a pill has been re-crushed and then cut and then turned into more pills. So just because it's a pill and it, you're being told this is straight off the boat from um, The Hague, it doesn't need to be the case. Okay, thank, you. Um, thank you very much for attending everyone. Um, we'll certainly let everyone know when the next Greens List um, CPD breakfast is. Uh, and of course you have access to the papers through the Greens List website, but if you've got any queries that come up you can always email um, either Justin or Frank directly. So thanks for coming along today.